Welcome back to Meeting in Middle America. We're here at the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And today on the show, we have representatives Robin Vining and Adam Nealon, a Democrat and a Republican representing Southeast Wisconsin. We talk about their participation recently in a series called Red and Blue Dialogues, where we bring legislators and constituents together across the political divide. And we also talk about the issues important to Southeast Wisconsin, which will be critical in the upcoming election. Hope you enjoy the show. Well, we're here at the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center, and I'm joined with two wonderful friends. Representative Robin Vining, who's my home state representative yeah. in Brookfield, Wisconsin, yeah. and uh, Representative Adam Nalen, who represents Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and he's a co-chair of the Wisconsin Future Caucus, which is affiliated with the Millennial Action Project. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Happy to be here. So we were together just a couple of months ago at the Millennial Action Project Red and Blue Dialogues in Brookfield, Wisconsin, and we were talking about energy and the environment, and we'll get to that, but I first want to talk about your own personal journeys first, getting into politics, and I'll start with you, Representative Vining. You are in your first term, okay. and so what led you to run for office in the first place? Um, seeing things that, um, or I guess just, just wanting life to be better for families than, than I was seeing it. Mm -hmm. So um, I've spent a lot of time working in the nonprofit world. I'm a small business owner, but I spend a lot of time working in the nonprofit world. And I was seeing a lot of pain and suffering that I thought if we were to get to the root of the problem, that um, really that root is legislative change. So it took me out of um, working in the nonprofits um, to, to, to get to the root of the, what I saw as the root of the problem. Yeah. What's been your biggest surprise since being at the state capitol? I get that question a lot. Yeah. I probably have a different answer on a different day. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. I probably have, I have probably no, I, I went into it with probably intentionally no expectations because I think it's wise to go into something brand new without really knowing exactly what it's going to be and, um, and to take it with, just t take it as it comes and mm -hmm. then, which is kind of how I operate, um, take, take things in, figure out what's happening and then figure out what to do with it. So. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. And Representative Nalen, uh, you have uh, an interesting background having started uh, some businesses before and then you ran for office and now you've been um, a leader on a variety of issues. But tell us a little bit about your journey into public service. Sure, yeah, happy to. So I'm actually in my fourth term now. Uh, so, and before that, I worked for Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner. And I didn't know I was going to be working in politics. I actually, uh, just really fell in love with politics in college for whatever reason. I just really uh, was enamored by the idea that if you can have a majority of people support what you think, you can make a change in the world. And I thought that was really neat, that you can change the world by just convincing people that's the right thing to do. Uh, so I started getting involved in politics, and I volunteered. And I met Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner uh, at a Christmas party. And I was talking to him, and he offered me a job. <laughs> And I, I didn't tell him I hadn't graduated yet. Uh, it was uh, so I, I showed up to uh, to work the next day, and I think I was, some people were surprised I was still in college. Um, so they offered me a paid internship, and I, I drove him. I was his driver. I worked in constituent services in the district, and um, I was still taking classes. So I was that nerdy kid on college campus wearing a suit and a briefcase <laughs> around to class because I would leave from my job, work, uh, or go to uh, take some classes at lunch, take some night classes, and I tried to make that work. And then once I graduated, I moved to D.C. Uh, I got out to D.C., and I, I was working out there for a while, and I said, you know what? I'm done with politics. <laughs> I, I decided that I missed Wisconsin. I wanted to work in the private sector. I had just, uh, you know, politics can be a grind when you, you come in with these bold uh, ideas and these ambitions of, I can make a change if I convince people it's the right thing to do. And then you find out that politics is a little bit trickier than that. You know, the, the best ideas don't always rise to the top. Right. It's a little more complicated, <laughs> you know. And at that time, I didn't really know how to work the system. I was a low-level staffer, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to move back to Wisconsin. So I moved back to Wisconsin, uh, started a, my, my first business, which I never expected to be doing, but I was, did a, worked in a window cleaning job in college. I came back, and I was like, what the heck am I going to do? And I didn't have a job. So I'm like, you know what? 
I know how to do that, right? So I just picked up the phone, started calling businesses, got a couple contracts, started this business up. I still have it going today, uh, which is nice. But then a spot opened up in the state assembly while I was in. I thought, you know what? Maybe this is the, an opportunity that I can actually work the system and make a difference because then instead of you know running someone else's ideas, trying to help, I can actually be my own person a little bit more and, and try to make that take that next step. So I thought I had something to offer uh, some somebody that's younger, uh, raised in a different generation, different time, and also had political experience and business experience, which I thought would be helpful. Uh, and also it helped that it was a short uh, six week special election. Right. So I was like, you know what? That is the key. You know, I don't have to take a year of my life to go campaign. I'll just give it a shot. It was just pre kids, pre mortgage, pre wife. So I had a little bit more flexibility to just put everything on hold and give it a shot. Uh, nobody thought I was going to win. I personally probably thought I wasn't going to win. Um, I was dating my wife at the time and I called her the night before the election and I said, you know, honey, I don't think I'm going to win. She said, it's all right, sweetie. You gave it your best shot. <laughs> and uh, at least she's encouraging. She was encouraging, you know, and I, I was too afraid. She was very, and I didn't even, uh, I, I didn't even feel comfortable enough to have a, like, a party. You know how people, uh, you know, they have their, their election night party or all their, I'm like, well, I'm probably not going to win. So I'm not going to invite all my supporters. So me and my wife and one other friend, we hid at uh, House of Guinness in Waukesha. I was back with one of my buddies used to own the House of Guinness, and that was like our little hangout. For some reason, somehow, the uh, Waukesha Freeman found out that I was going to be there on election night. So they show up, and after I found out I won, uh, I made a gesture like, oh. And somehow, <laughs> that was the photo. That was the photo. <laughs> On the front page of the Freeman the next day. Welcome nice. to politics. <laughs> Dylan wins by 29 votes. <laughs> <laughs> we need to find that photo. It's, it's, it's framed. It's, it's, it's on the wall of my office. Oh my gosh. Yeah, oh, I got to so. see that. That's so good. Well, and we, we have some national viewers who are tuning in. So if you're not familiar with this area, we're talking about Brookfield, Wauwatosa, Pewaukee. This is all suburban Milwaukee, essentially. And we'll talk about um, the issues of this region in a bit. But... Let's switch gears to the Red and Blue Dialogue that we did recently. And for those who aren't familiar, uh, this is a series of events that Millennial Act Action Project has been hosting across the state uh, that brought together legislators and constituents from across the uh, political divide uh, to build common understanding and sometimes new consensus on issues like the future of the workforce, or in the case of this most recent dialogue, energy and the environment. And so, Representative Vining, we were chatting uh, after the dialogue about some of your impressions from that experience. So, to share with kind of our audience here, what did you think of that type of experience? What were some of your um, impressions from a dialogue like that? Well, I think it has a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was really impressed that you, first of all, the room was packed. Mm -hmm. So, people are interested in this concept. Um, and as somebody who believes that we need to raise the level of discourse and really deepen how we talk to each other, I think that's part of how we find common ground and move forward. Um, I was really impressed that you packed out the room. It was completely full. So people are interested in this concept. And then you put them at tables with people who have diverse views. So you intentionally made sure that people who disagreed with each other were sitting at the same table. And then you gave them not only questions, but the tools to converse with others who have different opinions. And so to me, that's very exciting. Um, I look at this country and I see us as like, we're a laboratory of democracy. We, this is an idea that we're supposed to be working out. We're supposed to be continually growing, moving forward, getting better. And um, I loved that you were putting people together and giving them the skills to do it. So they come in with the opinions, but then you give them skills to interact with each other. And frankly, that's how you move forward. So right. I think it's really exciting. Yeah, no, we, uh, we had such a great conversation. It's available on, on Facebook if people want to tune in. But you were, you were making some really great points afterwards about as a state legislator, you have to hold town halls. You have to find creative ways to get constituent feedback. And to tell us a little bit more about how the town halls typically work, and you were making a good point about maybe there are ways that we can incorporate these principles of the Red and Blue Dialogue into town halls. And, and one related question to that is, uh, who are the 
types of people who would normally come out to a town hall? Is it just the people who hate you and love you the most? Or like, yeah, tell us more about that. Um, so first, I just want to say, I wouldn't say we have to hold town halls. Yeah. I would say we get to hold town yes. halls. Yes. Um, it's part of what we do. That's what um, I would say. Yeah, just to clarify <laughs> yeah. that. Um, but that's, so I think town halls have slowly over time become people who are frustrated come to express their frustration. And what that ends up doing, I think, is breaking the opportunity to build relationship with your legislator. I think it's really important for people to be able to express frustration. That's really important. And it's important for us to hear that. Um, but I think what it's also done is it's put a context where people, right now, I mean, healthcare is a really big concern. It's number one concern in Wisconsin. Um, and people don't want to tell their personal healthcare stories in the format of a town hall. Um, so it takes away that, like, if if you feel vulnerable with what you're saying, you don't want to be in a room where people are yelling at each other. Um, and then it's kind of because people are yelling, it's turned into like a Facebook Live thing, and which is good for accountability for politicians, bad for people who want to bring very sensitive situations to their legislators. So, um, so I think it pushes some voices out. But, um, but, and. I guess I have seen that trend, and then I saw the opportunity of how you run the red and blue dialogue and thought, well, this is just a fantastic idea. It's a better idea. And so what if you set up town halls in the very same way, where you are not only discussing really important issues and holding legislators accountable, um, but also giving people the tools to dialogue not only with their legislator, but with each other. Because when we walk out, we're gone, right? But Everybody lives in community with each other, so how do they how do they better dialogue on issues and really, frankly, better hold us accountable? Right, right, yeah. And I, I want to get to that piece as well. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the dialogue was when there was a, a woman who came up to me afterwards, and she was surprised to hear you, Representative Nalen, talking about the environment and and how you did a number of proactive things to advance environmental causes. And she's a liberal activist in your district, and she's saying, "I'm really starting to like that guy." <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get her vote, but it, <laughs> hey, she, she, she likes me a little bit more, so yes, that's exactly. positive, right? But that gets to the point that you were making, Robin, which is, you know, it, it, in this type of format, you're exposing people to a more constructive dialogue, and it's not just about a, a, an us versus them mentality. It's not an adversarial kind of relationship. It's more about opening your mind and trying to learn and maybe seeing a different viewpoint of, of your elected officials. So I'm curious from your standpoint, uh, Adam, what have been your techniques of getting constituent feedback and, and are there principles from the red and blue dialogues that could potentially be helpful? Sure, yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I do like about the red and blue dialogue and I think you know, as this progresses, I think uh, is an opportunity to work and grow this thing is to really have different views represented throughout it. Um, it's, it's important that there's a balance because, you know, in, in the Brookfield one was great because I feel like there was a lot of balance. And some of the ones I've done in the past, uh, it, it tends to be a little bit more on one side or the other, right. uh, which is fine. But I think one of the best things about that is you speak as an individual and you just get in trouble when, you know, I don't want to be on the defensive and being like, well, I'm the Republican, so I have to. You don't want to get into like a position where you're like, well, I got to say the talking points because like I'm the only one represented here, you know. So you just a little bit more on the defensive when the numbers are against you, and when there's a little more balance, it's easier to be more of an individual and say, you know, this is you know how I agree, this is how I disagree, and, and let's let's you know figure out you know individually how we can all work together to you know improve our community, improve the state. Uh, so I, I really do appreciate when we're able to bring in a lot of different um, you know, backgrounds and people with different perspectives. I think that's when the best dialogue happens. Um, some of the things that you know, I have done is obviously the town hall uh, route. And it's funny because you know, the longer you're in, the more when people know you, they start showing up and like, they trust you more and they're also, they show up more. Right. So now if I have a town hall, it'll be pretty well attended, I'd hope. But, you know, the first town hall I ever did, I advertised it in the paper, I put it on Facebook, I sent out a mailer, and one person showed up. Nice. Yeah, one. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I feel about this. This is pretty embarrassing. But I like to think that, you know, and you hit on something. I think most people, when they show up to tunnels, they're usually angry a little bit. Right. You know, so then I thought, you know what, if only one person's here, maybe I'm doing something right, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's not a, yeah. not a lot of people there to That's yell at me, point. you know? So, uh, but I think that there are ways that you can interact with people on a personal level. Uh, I think the town hall is, is great, but it's so important to make that personal connection. You know, I mean, whether it's me making a personal connection to somebody or them making that personal connection to me, whether they're just representing their community or themselves or, or an organization, it's nice to have like a face to a cause or to a mission that really helps humanize. And, and then you also build this base of experts or people that are on the ground that you're like, huh, how is this gonna impact paper mills? And you have uh, people that you know that maybe worked at a paper mill or maybe have that experience, and then it helps you do your job better. So I think it goes both ways, not only for people to reach out and talk about what they care about, but also to make that connection so we have resources, so we're able to reach out and make those connections when things come up. Uh, so I, I think it's important, you know, and town halls, red and blue dialogues, but also just showing up to things, you yeah. know, the pancake breakfast in the morning, the dairy breakfast, the, you know, different things throughout the community that you do to participate and be involved and active in because it's important to make those personal connections. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now I want to get back to your point, Representative, about how do you further incentivize lawmakers, both while they're governing and then when they're campaigning to have this more inclusive dialogue, a more respectful form of rhetoric and you were telling me how you know when you're knocking on doors you hear this concern from your constituents constituents a lot how how can legislators in general just work together and be more like um, more inclusive more more respectful and um, and you mentioned how, how can we be held accountable so what sort of thoughts do you have on on that idea how can legislators in general be held accountable for modeling the type of political discourse uh, that we want to see? I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I will say, like, the number good. one thing that we hear on doors is healthcare, and right behind it is please stop fighting with each other and get something done. I mean, it's right there. And so um, it's really, really important to people that we raise the level of discourse and deepen how we relate to each other. Um, how can we be held accountable? I mean, you should hold us accountable to that, <laughs> <Right>. Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Putting things on a camera, yeah, like, right? That's right, yeah. Putting on podcasts. Right yeah, maybe that's you the can hold me accountable right <laughs> yes. now. Um, I, I mean, I try, to, I try to hold myself accountable to how I treat people. Um, ask me more. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and also, I guess, another way of looking at it, are, what are the incentives, right? Because it's like you, you get to the state capitol, and then it feels, at least to the average observer, of politics, it feels like the political conversation just breaks down so quickly. Like Adam was saying, the best ideas don't necessarily, you know, rise to the top. So have you seen things from your experience now, having worked in the state capitol, that illustrate some of the incentives that lead to that breakdown in conversation? Like, what really is it behind the scenes? Oh, the incentives that lead to the breakdown? Yeah, just um, being able to, you know, like your constituents say, how can you stop fighting with each other? Like, what, you know, what, what, what's the breakdown like once you kind of get there? <laughs> or is that a, a hard lot of question? That's, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, if there it's are some of these questions. It's probably different for different relationships, sure. too. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, some of these, I mean, if we had these answers, the world would be a lot better place, yeah, right? Yeah. The reason yeah. we're trying to figure this out. But I think if I could just add just one word, I think makes all the difference, and that's just trust, Yeah. right? I mean, ultimately, you wanna build trust with your colleagues the same way you want your constituents to trust you, because you're never gonna agree with somebody 100% of the time, right? There's a lot of things that I do as a legislator, like working on autonomous vehicles and drones that are super unpopular in my district. But ultimately, what I wanna do is I wanna build trust with my constituents that, you know what, he's looking out for the best interest of our state in the future, and sometimes you gotta provide a little latitude and a little flexibility for somebody to be a leader and take upon these issues that are unpopular. And I think that's the same when you're working with your colleagues, you know? I mean, me and Robin aren't always gonna agree with each other. You know, I'm on a, I'm a committee chair of Jobs in the Economy, and we don't always agree. But every bill we pass has some level of bipartisan support. And I think the reason is partially because they trust me that I'm not trying to like put one over on them 
right? I'm not trying to like make them look bad. You know, I'm not trying to play gotcha, you know, and try to put them in a position where they're gonna take an unpopular vote. That I'm gonna listen to their amendments, that I'm gonna provide them the flexibility and the latitude to it when they're on the mic and they're asking questions. I'm not gonna cut them off even if it's a hard question. You know, so you just wanna provide that basic level of trust that when you're able to work together, you're not always gonna agree, but you trust that person that they're not gonna screw you over and make you look bad. And I think that's what we need to work to and that's what we need to build up because too often politics becomes a sport, you know, and there's too many people that are, you know, they have the scoreboard up and this person's up and this person's down and who's winning and who's losing. And ultimately you don't get the best policy when you think of it like that. You know, you gotta be able to work together because everybody has good ideas. You know, you might not always agree, but if you can trust each other that you want what's best, you're able to get a lot more done. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, you've made so many great points about trust through our time working together with the Millennial Action Project. And you've mentioned before that, that your role in the Future Caucus, one of the biggest benefits of that is you've built trusting relationships with um, other legislators through a vehicle like that. So, and, and we've been working together officially through that for probably like two years now right. is my guess. So right. how do you reflect on that whole experience and you've been to some of our summits with Millennial Action Project and you've built these relationships. Yeah. How do you just put into perspective that whole journey? Well, it's interesting, you know, and I think one of the, one of the you know, I've said this before is, you know, the, the trust issue and be able to work together, but also getting ideas from different states, you know, and me being able to share ideas. One of the most interesting things that happened to me, and I don't know if I've shared this with you from the Millennial Action Project, uh, is, you know, when we had that summit in Nashville and uh, I was speaking on economic development and I'm like, one of the best things we can do, and this is nonpartisan, this should be across, is we should look at non-competes, right? We should reform non-competes, make it more employee friendly so people have more flexibility to get paid more, they have more opportunity to start businesses. And I shared with some of my ideas and a legislator from Oregon, I, the name will lose me, but she uh, got- Julie Fahey. Julie. Julie came up to me and she goes, guess what? We got your idea passed in Oregon. And I'm like, I can't even get it passed in Wisconsin. How are you able to do that? And, I, and part of me was like, I can't believe it. And part of me was like really proud that we were able to like form these relationships that were like, she trusted again that, you know, I had an idea that was going to help and I'm a Republican, she's a Democrat. Um, but we were able to share the, this opportunity and we were able to get something done. And, uh, Oregon's going to be a better place because of it, you know, and now we're going to have to do that same thing in Wisconsin. But I think some of those interactions, some of those opportunities that you're able to share, look, we might not have the support yet in Wisconsin, but other states, if you look at this, this is going to be good for our country. You know, there's people's wages are going to go up. There's going to be more uh, innovation. That's a good thing. And I think that if every state implemented it, we're not competing necessarily directly on this. Uh, so if every state, you know, was able to do that, we're going to be a better country because of it. Yeah, no, I if, love that. If yeah. I can tag into that, I think um, our constituents want to want to know when, like, if their if their legislators are building relationships with other legislators across the aisle, and um, I think that's something they care about. Um, but also, not everything we work on is partisan. Not every topic fits into a partisan platform, right. and so I think one of the ways that we can build relationships is to find issues that are not partisan and then build relationships working with other legislators on them. And I'll say, um, I mean, I'm at, I sit on the health committee and a lot of what we do is hotly contested. Um, I sit on the children and families committee and we are together on most things. And, um, and that gives a relation, the ability to build relationships with people. I mean, we're in a room agreeing most of the time. Um, and, and I think that's, it's, not everything has to be partisan. Yeah. And, yeah, that's right. Now, one more question for both of you, because we have a national audience. People are tuning in from all across the country. People hear a lot about Wisconsin being the tipping point state for the 2020 election. <laughs> so we're going to go right to partisan now? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> now, no, trust I'm me, I'm very good <laughs> at framing nonpartisan questions. <laughs> so let me frame it this way, which is, the areas that you represent, suburban Milwaukee, you know, it's, it's not an overstatement to say that it will have a defining role you know, in the election. And so a lot of people would want to know, what are some of the key issues that Southeast Wisconsin is facing um, from your standpoint? And, and either of you can jump in on that. I mean, yeah. healthcare is number one yeah. that I hear about. Healthcare costs, accessibility, and affordability. Or, accessibility, afford, or, yeah. <laughs> 
healthcare. <laughs> um, accessibility, affordability, but also that it's high quality. Yeah. Um, that all three of those are imperative. Um, that is the number one thing that people cry about on their front steps. Yeah. And um, and so I think that's going to be a key issue in the election. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I. I could wax poetic for a long time about just like putting on my political science hat and just like talking about how Wisconsin's changed. Uh, you know, we used to be a state that was considered a swing state because the rural communities in western and northern Wisconsin tended to be swing and the suburbs were strong Republican and the urban areas were strongly Democrat. And that's kind of flipped a little changing, bit. Yeah. You know, I mean, we got. Uh, Robin's a perfect example, right? I mean, this may be the first time in my lifetime a Democrat has represented, uh, well, not in my lifetime, but in my, certainly in my political career, Democrats represented Waukesha County, you know? And so, I mean, the suburbs has changed a little bit, and now we're pretty strong in uh, the rural communities where uh, the, the toss-ups have kind of changed, and there's uh, changing demographics. And I also think, you know, it used to be, you know, the, the, the phrase was, all politics are local. Well, now it's like all politics are national, right? I mean, when you knock on doors, I mean, there are very important local issues going on in my community with like Waukesha water, like our, our water application to Lake Michigan. You have different transportation, like construction projects that people care about, but mostly people want to talk about national politics, you know? And it's being able to cut through that noise and talk about some of the things that are going on at the state uh, but ultimately, it's almost a futile effort, right? And that ultimately, it's going to come down to a lot of, you know, a lot of politics now has become national. They've become international. And for better or worse, that's the position we're in. And I think that what we kind of, as a state, we spend a lot of time trying to get our message out. But ultimately, you know, a lot of people are going to decide if they're Republicans or Democrats or who they're voting for based on the president, based on the top of the ticket, you know, based on some of the things that are out of our control. Mm -hmm. So we just got to do a good job for us just to putting a face to kind of our district saying, hey, I'm my own person, you know, I'm my own, like, this is what I believe in. But I think Robin's right, healthcare has been a big one. Um, but at the state level, I mean, right now we're dealing, you know, dealing with a surplus, right? So. Uh, we're in a better position than a lot of states where we have a projected surplus. And now the discussion isn't like, well, how, uh, what can we do to balance our budget? The discussion is, how should we spend the surplus funds and how should we do it? And I think there's a lot of discussion and disagreement about what we're going to do. Then I think that might spill over into the election cycle and, and kind of show what people's priorities are. If it's you know, put more money into education, no cut taxes, pay off transportation debt, you know? So I think those, some of those conversations are gonna spill over into our elections and kind of what people care about and kind of show, you know, where the splits are. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it's gonna be a national election. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, thank you both so much for joining us on the yeah, show. We're, we're kicking off the, the show this week and it's been a lot of fun, but I couldn't ask for two better guests.